Hey everyone, uh, so we're back again with another one of our interviews in our interview series where we want to pass the mic and um, give voice to other perspectives. Um, today we have an interview with David Winkler, who is speaking all about being an African-American and Latina Republican in Trump's America. I hope you enjoy listening. So I'm David Winkler. I'm actually a native of Southern California or um, Orange County. I know you guys probably seen the TV show and all that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I, I grew up there, um, but I kind of lived all over the place. So um, when I was really young, I got to live in Vancouver, Canada. I went to high school in, in Derry, Northern Ireland. Um, but uh, we all know the, the story of 9-11. Um, right after 9-11, I would say about two, two and a half years later, I joined the Marines. Um, so I... Uh, I spent four years in the Marines. I deployed to Fallujah. I went to um, Helmand Province. Um, and then I switched over to the Army. I spent about 10 years in the Army. But while I was in the Army, I was also doing veteran advocacy. So I worked uh, helping out our veterans, um, you know, with all sorts of stuff. Um, wounded warrior kind of issues, um, like uh, dealing with um, VA benefits, um, fighting claims. Um, actually helping families get to hospitals after their loved ones were um, medevaced from the battlefield. Um, you name it, I helped in that realm. Um, and so as soon as I got out of active duty, I got over to New Jersey. Um, and I'm naturally a Republican, right? Um, I'm actually a half. So I'm actually half Black and half Latina. So you guys have probably heard of both the, the Blexit and the Lexit movements, right? I actually belong to both of those movements. So, um, I'm a conservative, which I know I guess is rare to hear from a black and a, and a Latino conservative aspect, right? But yes, I believe in conservative values, and that's 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 who I am naturally, um, because I, I believe in a lot of things like small businesses, um, you know, lower taxes, all that great stuff, which I think you guys are probably going to get into a little bit later on, right? But that's pretty much my introduction is I, I went from military to politics now and, and I deal in that realm and I try to help the minority community understand that naturally they are conservative and they just don't realize it. So, I didn't ask. Should we get straight into it? I have, I have a question that I think Samia kind of alluded to, one of the more difficult ones. How can you be, especially in, you know, I'm sure you've heard the term Trump's America, so how can we, how can you be both Republican and black and Hispanic and Latino, sorry, in Trump's America? How does that work? How are you supporting somebody who's made many, for the lack of a better word, bigoted and racist comments towards all of those, you know, your, your heritage? How does that work? Well, it's, here's the funny thing, right? So if you guys... We call them the fourth estate here in America, all right? We call the media um, the fourth estate. I'm one of those that is independent thinking, and I think for myself. So uh, any time that I hear an accusation, what the first thing I do is I look at all the sources, right? And I look at all the media, uh, whether it be, you know, Fox, CNN, whatever. I also look at the, the articles. Here's what happens what, quite a lot when they do it to Trump. You hear this... Um, sources told me, right, or somebody told me, and it's never named sources. There's a problem with that, because if I can't identify your sources and somebody told me you said something about a certain race or whatever, I tend to not believe what you're saying because you're not you're not telling me or identifying who your source is, and that's that's what a lot of our our journalism is in the states, and it's it's designed on purpose because I can make an attack towards you, but as soon as I start questioning who, who really, who heard you or who, who said it or whatever, they get all defensive and like, no, I, they, somebody said something against, you know, he, he said something. Here's the thing on what you're talking about from the Latino community, right? So you're talking about how Trump, how can I be like, whatever, right? We got a serious problem. I grew up in California where immigration was an issue. The Democrat party is taking advantage of the immigrants while at the same time being like, oh, diversity, inclusion, all this great stuff. Because what they're essentially doing is leaving us in a perpetual state of poverty. Because yes, it's cool. You can get us, you can get the Latino community over here from Mexico, right? You can bring all the immigrants up from Mexico. 
but they're not able to do anything. So they're just staying in a, in a state of, of poverty, which I don't agree with because I want them to have citizenship, not working underneath the table for like two bucks an hour, um, not having medical insurance, not having health or, you know, health, uh, life insurance, not being able to really get their kids to great schools or anything like that. So, yeah, cool. Democrats, you got them over here, but you're not helping them or you're not actually giving them what they need. Um, the, the Republicans, the reason why they're so huge on that is they identified that. They were like, no, why bring them over here if they're not going to be able to, to participate in the economy? You're actually hurting them, not helping them. Um, and so me now living over in New Jersey and New York, there's about 400,000 undocumented immigrants. I can walk out my street. I can go down, you know, a few blocks and there will be there will be an apartment complex that has probably about and to 14 of them huddled in a, in a garage sized space. And I know for a fact that they work for like, this is how I know, because they're working about $2 an hour for some restaurant. And if they get sick or get hurt, they're laid off. And there's nothing they can do legally to, you know, to fight that and say, hey, let, keep, let me keep my job. So I know for a fact they're being used. Um, and then they're underneath sanctuary laws to where federal law enforcement can't come in here and do anything about it. They can't, you know, um, help them get their families back to um, the country they came from. A lot of times you don't want to go back to that country. I understand that piece, but you, you can't just violate federal laws like that. And I don't know if you guys knew, but it actually is a United States code that deals with this. Uh, 1325, 1326, which is both a federal and a civil um, violation. If you come over to our borders and you, you lie or you kind of Try to stay past the visa, all that kind of stuff. Yes, that is actually U.S. code, which is kind of interesting because I'm like Democrats. You're, you always preach about nobody's above the law. Or you always hear them say nobody's above the law, right? But how can you violate U.S. You know, USC code? So, I mean, that's, that's kind of my spin on that. Now, when it comes to the African-American community, I just think a lot of it is, is just – a lot of it is, you know, he said, she said kind of attacks. I haven't seen – Trump be absolutely racist because he would be the worst racist ever if it came to the black community. Because I'm going to tell you, this guy's done a lot for the black community. You guys know, are you guys familiar with H, uh, the uh, historical black colleges and universities? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. This guy permanently funded those universities and gave them an actual section in the White House to work from. He also, um, he did a re or oh, geez, it's too early in the morning. Pretty much what he did is he, invest, he invested into the low-income community. So he gave over hundreds of millions of dollars to low-income communities. He's also responsible for that Justice and Policing Act. And the first step, which was to remove the harmful policies in the 1994 crime bill, which was the, responsible for the mass incarceration of the black and brown community when it came to nonviolent um you know, criminal stuff like uh, marijuana, um, which now is mostly legal in the United States. There's some federal issues still, um, but it's, I, find it, I find it quite interesting because now Biden and Harris, those are the two that did it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. It, it's hard for me to sit here and say, hey, Trump's a racist when he, his policies are actually the opposite of it. His actual history, 30, 40 year history is actually the opposite. I don't know if you guys knew this, but he got an Ellis Island Award, all right? And right beside him when he got the award was Rosa Parks, all right? And Muhammad Ali. There's a lot that pe the, the left is just not telling you about Donald Trump because they just like to attack, attack, attack. They, they were not, Donald Trump was not supposed to win. It was supposed to be Hillary Clinton. And they've been upset for the whole entire four years that Hillary Clinton has, has been, or they got, you know, got defeated. So that that's my take on it. I don't know how you guys so. David, um, you made a lot of points. So I had to take notes on some of them so we can address yeah. them. So I think the first one you talked about was the media. And I think everyone sitting here can undeniably agree that the media has bias for yeah. um, both directions. And like you said, we are all educated people and free thinkers. So we can, you know, work between them and think through yeah. that. However, and you did mention that it was a lot of, oh, a source said this, it was anonymous and all this ambiguity about yeah. it. But actually, I have seen videos where he comes out and says things 
some, you know, and uh, um, videos, podcasts, um, news interviews. Tweets. Where he, he yeah, go ahead. Says bring, bring them up because I, I love I love actually hearing it. like what which ones are are you referring to because uh, what usually people bring up to Charlottesville. The what? Charlottesville. Is what usually happens here in the United States. People were like, "Oh, there's good people on both sides." If that's that's, the that's a that's a side one. We can talk about one of the most recent one where he, um, where the guy that shot uh, two black protesters said he was saying he defended himself, but didn't come out and say anything about the the guy that the protest was about, um, Blake, because um, he, he died in that. So. I think just in general, Trump has said racist things on. But on I gotta, media. I gotta, I gotta give you a little. Um, so, back. for example, let me link it to okay. something that you may be able to relate to. You are from a Latino descent, and he mm -hmm. and he said that Latinos are rape, rapists. He and that was on that was recorded. No, he didn't say that. The, the context of it, you got to understand what he's talking about. We got, it wasn't all of the Latinos or all, there was, he was talking about, they're not setting us their best, right? There's a whole concept, a whole talk about that. He was not saying all of Mexicans are bad, but he's saying there is a huge problem going on down there in the Southern border. And I, me being Latino, no, you have coyotes down there. You have human traffickers. This is the last chance yeah, he, to, to, to get that when they come across the border. You have fentanyl, cocaine, heroin, you have MS-13, you have cartels, you have all these people that are purposely exploiting these borders. The Democrats want to make it look like that nothing like that is happening going on down there or little amounts of it is happening. It's a huge problem. You can ask any of the border patrol that goes from Texas to Arizona to California to all of them. They're, they're going to tell you that that's exactly what's going on. I work with the federal law enforcement over here in New York. I know that goes on in our Port Authority. I thank God for the, yeah, uh, the, the stand-up of human trafficking. Huh? Sorry, um, I just, Sorry. on that, yeah, no, really quickly, so obviously you're speaking about um, the crime and stuff from the yeah. Latino community. Um, there's crime in every ethnicity, yeah. in every community, so do you not think it's quite divisive to then say, oh, Latinos are rapists, or Latinos do this, Latinos do that, because it's actually a human problem. But it's you got to you got to take his exact words. He was talking about what's going on in the when it comes to immigration and them coming over here. Mexico is not known, as I said, when you're crossing the border, to be doing the right thing. A lot of people try to claim asylum, but they're not doing so fleeing from something. What they're doing is economic asylum, which is actually not asylum at all. You cannot claim econo economic asylum here. And it goes back to U.S. federal codes, right? If we want to change the system, you got to do it correctly. You can't just, you know, parlay as soon as you get over here and you violated a U.S. code. You have to have Congress change the rules. It's still illegal unless Congress actually says, hey, you know what, I'm going to change the laws on this. And we, then, that, then I'll be all in agreement. But you can't just break, you know, break freaking U.S. codes and then, you know, have Democrats go ahead and shield you from that. You can't do that. Okay, right? I, hear, I hear what you're saying, but I need touched upon, you know, trafficking. But what about the fact that Trump is actually funding ICE where there have been actual registered cases of child trafficking? Over 300 kids have been missing because of, you know, his, his heart on immigration and, and his, you know, his plight of, yeah, we're going we're gonna to end, you know, illegal immigration. What is happening under his nose is there's tra sex trafficking, child trafficking occurring, because of his laws so i don't it's not because of him it's because of sanctuary sanctuary i don't know if you know this but it stops federal law enforcement from being able to do its job it's the whole design behind sanctuary laws here in new jersey i can't do my job because of the attorney general here there it, he's literally protecting the the whole immigration which is actually backwards because if you allowed me to do my job, I can get after human traffickers. I can get after all the people that are hurting the immigrants. I don't care about people who just randomly come here and overstay their visa. That's not what I'm here for. I'm here to take out criminal immigrants. That's what the federal law enforcement is trying to do. The ones that are actually trying to, uh, you know, sell women into sex or sex trafficking, or the ones that are selling fentanyl to your children, to your people here. 
right? That's what I'm after. I'm not after the ones that overstay a visa. That's the actual myth about ICE. ICE is not there for that. They're there for criminal activity. And there's actually certain categories, whether it be rape, uh, whether it be sexual assaults, whether it be, um, you know, murders, all that stuff. They're, they take care of that. ICE is actually part of DHS or Department of Homeland Security. They don't have time to sit there and go over like people who overstay their visa. That's not that's not what their funding is for. Um, and DHS is also, by the way, the one that's starting the new Heroes program, the one that is going to have uh, disabled veterans get after human traffickers. So it's going to be another part, a part of or another arm in them. But I would say a lot of people have this like misunderstanding of how ICE really works. They're not, I've, I've seen these guys, I've dealt with them, they have, they do not care if you overstay your visa. That is, that is an immigration admin, or admin, you know, issue over there, right? You're not gonna have ICE come to your door if you stay three weeks because you went to Disneyland and you decided to stay after, right? Nobody's, nobody cares. Like, yeah, obviously you're gonna get in trouble if you overstay like 90, uh, you know, a few, or past like your visa time and you decide to get a job and all like, is that then, then they're going to start to notice like, Hey, you're not, you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing, but you're not going to get deported. So what about the non-criminals yeah. um, who are genuinely going over there to maybe flee a certain situation? That comes down to Congress. We actually look at this backwards. It's you can't attack an enforcement agency for the lack of competency from Congress. But Congress isn't sets these rules. Isn't but in terms of, do you want Congress to change their um, stance and policy on immigration? Are you calling for Congress to allow um, more immigrants in and allow them to stay in this country illegally? Is this what you're saying? No, what I'm calling for is them to fix their whole um, immigration. Like as you're saying, yes, I want them to fix immigration, but not that way. I want them to have real pathways you... to citizenship. Right now, there, you, like, if you come over here on an F visa, an H visa, a C visa, a J visa, and all that, those categories take for freaking ever. And you're paying a ridiculous amount through attorneys. And it literally leads you to dang near nowhere, right? And so I got buddies that have been here for like 10 years, and they're still going through those court battles. Why is it taking that long? That is a, that is a congressional okay. function. That is a house function to where they are, they are messing it up. I will give you an example. We have a um, Eastern District Court here in New York, 26 Federal Plaza. They're supposed to handle all immigration. Why is it that they only have 300 total staff? So that is from your judges to your magistrates that deal with this. But meanwhile, you have over 400,000 cases each year going through a court that only has 300 people working there. Do you really think you're gonna get all 400,000 through? But isn't that a funding issue then? It's because it, yeah, it's it guess who funds it? Congress. Guess, guess who makes all the rules for this? Congress. They, the they have Congress, to fix um, their issues. You can't blame it on law enforcement because law enforcement is only carrying out what Congress dictates. So yeah, it's what, Congress Republican. Yeah. yeah. Congress no, Republican. The House right now is majority Democrat. The Senate is majority Republican. So on this issue, a lot of times it's handled at the House level. It's not handed at, handled at the uh, Senate level. So when I, like, every single time you see ICE go in front of the House, it's always Democrat-led right now. Because since 2018, they took the majority of it. What they've used their time for is to attack DHS. They used their time to attack the, the Homeland Security heads. They've attacked anything that's dealt with it because it's a political expedient way of just uh, getting after Trump. Oh, you're responsible for this. You're responsible. No, actually, you, House, you're responsible for laying down the rules for immigration, not President Trump. Okay. And, and pre-2018, who was in charge? So 2018 is, is when the Democrats took over the majority of the House. That's where Nancy yeah, Pelosi ended up getting the gavel and becoming and before the that. David, before that, she was in charge. Before that, well, that was Republicans. Yes. And in fact, and if we want to talk about immigration, I actually will tell you the truth on this. This is multiple administrations. This goes back before Obama. Mm -hmm. This goes back to Bush. This goes back to Clinton. There is a, and immigration has been one of our weakest points in, in America. We have not been able to tackle this for multiple administrations. And, I, and I'm a Republican that will tell you, 
we failed on this from a Republican side and we failed from it on a Democrat side. But the only ones that can fix this is Congress. Okay. But why didn't Congress fix it before? So like, so all, of, all the opinions that you have, do you think the rest of your, the rest of the Republicans in America agree with you in the sense that you're saying there should be a better pathway for immigrants to come through and get real citizenship? Um, because it doesn't seem like, it seems no. like Republicans' point of view on immigration is just no immigration. get them all out. Yeah, like unless, point blank. unless they're rich, essentially, and can be called expats. And also, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily agree with that. I think Republicans do, but they want real pathways. The thing is, is what they don't want is open borders. That's what you hear quite a lot, right? Open borders is a separate issue from from the immigration aspect. They, they, what they're saying is America is a sovereign nation, and to be a sovereign nation, you must have borders, right? Which is a security issue. Um, there's a lot of, um, if you guys do your research into the land that's right around the borders, there's a lot of problems happening around the land um, where the borders are at. Tunnels being dug, as I said, a lot of crime happening, a lot of other things happening right around those border towns. This is not, this, this is what the Republicans are trying to protect. They, the Democrats tackled that and got on top of it and was like, hey, you know what? I can use this towards a race aspect and be like, oh, we're, we're being racist. No, what we're doing is trying to protect those towns, trying to protect the people. Um, a few months ago, you guys probably never heard of it, but there was a Syrian extremist who came up through Corpus or came through Mexico up through Corpus uh, Christi and tried to attack in a military or tried to attack a military base. He was actually killed by a, a military MP, a female MP. But this is what we're trying to stop. When you got when you got open borders like that and people do that, that's a problem. And I, I would say England <laughs> England would be the same. You guys are a sovereign nation. You guys have borders in England. So I don't understand. You guys should want some sort of safety for your citizens in England. I, I completely agree. Like everyone wants to feel safe where they're living. But do you not think that um, the focus on immigrants is a bit like a bit hypocritical considering there's so there's so much danger from a domestic point of view like within america within your borders let's just look at gun laws for yeah, one second and amendment the, yeah and the amount of um mass shootings there have been like i feel like you actually have to sort out your own back garden as well um and those issues are actually more pressing than the crime coming from immigrants yeah like all the massacres that have happened i think the longest month the only month without a massacre, like, well, in, in the past few months, I remember seeing on, you know, reading about it was March because all the schools were closed because it was lockdown. So just looking at all of the, you know, so many kids, part, like, yeah, have been victims to gun crime. So many adults have been victims to gun crime. And often there seems to be a different re rhetoric if the person is white compared to if the person isn't white. So what is it? Like, how, how do you think? I, I guess I would, I would I guess I would tackle the first piece, right? Yeah. So the Second Amendment, and it's it's interesting that it, we're talking about Second Amendment. It was it was made so that we did not fall victim to another British monarchy type thing, right? Our forefathers were fighting against the British. They were fighting against the tyranny of the British at that time. When they came out with the Second Amendment, what it was was to protect the people. A lot of people think that the Second Amendment has something to do with hunting, that has something to do with whatever. No, what it is is to protect people against the government, right? The right to bear arms. There's actually a 2008 Supreme Court case called Heller, right? Which is actually what the legal precedent is right now. The Supreme Court did find that the individuals do have the right to bear arms individually, outside of a militia. They do have the right to uh, hold and bear arms, right? This is what I try to tell people. You, as, as minorities, that's why the Second Amendment works for you as well. So if we're feeling oppressed, we feel that there's a problem, why are we bucking the Second Amendment? We should be buying firearms to protect us, right? It works both ways, both on the white side and the, and the black side. We all have the ability to buy arms or buy and hold arms, right? The second thing that I find interesting is people want to use um, mass shootings. When you look through the FBI statistics and the databases and all that stuff, 
when you quantify what is a mass shooting, technically you have mass shootings going on every single day in places like Chicago. You have it going on in New York. You have it going on anywhere. Because if you shoot more than one or two people, guess what? That's a mass shooting. And a lot of gang shootings are that way. But what is not actually translated in the statistics are things like that. What you saw was, you know, the, the Parkland shooting. You saw a few other things like that. But anytime you shoot more than one person, that is, it becomes, it starts becoming a mass, it starts becoming a mass shooting. Now, I don't know exactly what you're, you guys are trying to get at with this or what you guys want to hear um, or, you know, question wise, but I don't necessarily believe that we have as big an issue with the Second Amendment here as people make it out to be. What I think is, is we have an outcry for more gun control when we have a lot of gun control here. People are just not enforcing that those current laws. Why make more laws if you're not even going to enforce the laws you have? And it comes down once again to lawmakers not enforcing or not fixing the current laws. Like right now, they have extensive background checks. You hear you hear Democrats and Republicans say this all the time: background checks. Um, even I think red flag laws now, where your neighbors can kind of tell on you if they think you have some sort of mental issue or whatever, and then they, they can confiscate your guns, which is a big problem that actually violates our Second Amendment. Um, but I don't see I don't see the problems that you guys are seeing. I, what I do what I do agree with is those mass shootings are a problem, right? But I actually look at it differently than you guys. I look at it as we need to deal with the behavioral health and the psychology of what's going on in our high schools and our junior highs and all that, because there's a lot of not only cyberbullying, but there is a lot of bullying that leads to these kids have feeling like they have nowhere else to go. They pick up a gun and they start shooting. Because what we, what we see is the back end of that. We see a, the victims of the, of the shooting and we go, oh, poor victims. But if you were to do a deep dive, I guarantee you they put these people through hell, right? You just don't show up at a school one day and decide to shoot everybody. That's not how that works. Yeah. Um, yeah. Have you guys ever seen 13 Reasons Why? Yeah. We, must, we actually we agree, agree with, with that. We saying. agree with that in every, in every crime. Yeah. Um, that there's, people look more so at what happens. Once that person is a criminal, nobody cares what led to it, those. Exactly. People. You guys saw 13 Reasons Why, right? Yeah. Yeah, do you remember that, that boy that got, uh, I think it was raped in the bathroom and all that and other stuff, yeah. and he showed up to the prom with a gun? Yeah, Nobody yeah. ever sees that piece. What they see is the guy that shoots, and then they're like, oh, poor victims now. And I'm like, no, wait a moment. We got to tackle the behavioral health aspect here. We got to tackle, you will not bully kids the way that you, like, I hate that. In, in America, mm -hmm. it's horrible to go through high school, whether you're a girl or a boy. If you're not popular and you get start to get picked on, a lot of suicides tend to happen. Yeah, but, don't, yeah, but this I, is what I'm saying. Don't you don't you feel like um, a lot of the time, like for example, Trump's whole campaign was we need to build a wall, we need to build a wall, uh, a wall. And my issue is there's there's so many more other pressing matters. Like you've just listed some the mental health of young people in America. Um, there's so much like the, the way the schooling system works anyways districts the fact that you have hundreds of kids in the class it's very different in england we have like probably maximum 30 people so bullying isn't as much of an issue because teachers probably don't, don't get me wrong it's still an issue but teachers spot things a little bit easier because the classrooms are easier to manage so there's a lot of stuff that you guys can work on and focus on but my issue is a lot of trump's um campaigns rhetorics tweets they're really divisive and yeah. they're actually all about separating communities rather than fixing real long-term issues that could have a positive impact on America, especially for the younger generation, like you've just spoken about, who are actually the future. Well, here, here's the thing. Trump has never been known to be, like his tweets, I even agree. A lot of times his tweets are, are kind of asinine. I'm just going to put it out that way, right? Or like where I just want to be like, tweet, or what are you doing, Trump? But what I focus on is, is the policies. When you guys mentioned school, he gave us a gift, right? And that gift is school choice. So when we sit here and we talk about, um, you know, the systematic racism or we talk about um, institutionalized, right? School choice was designed to give us an even playing field because I know what you're talking about with the district, in, right? And, you know, kids not being able to go to the good schools, they have to go to that failing public school and within inside <laughs> their district. That's school choice. What it ended up doing by giving you a voucher was saying, hey, 
I live in that poor district in that area that has that failing public school, but by this voucher, my kid can now go ahead and go to that good school over here that's in that, you know, that has a, you know, whether a lot of times we like to put it as in like rich white people, but I will tell you the Asian community over here, um, and, and I would say, I'm gonna use Brooklyn. The best school in Brooklyn is actually predominantly Asian. It's not white or whatever. Even white people have a hard time getting in the school because it comes down to the standardized testing. But that's what that's what school choice did was allowed you know all people of all different backgrounds to say, hey, in four communities, I'm going to give you that equal shot at that nice school or that good school. I, I went to school in the UK, and I agree with you guys. Your system is actually better when it comes to in high school, uh, you know, with the GCSEs, the A levels, and all that stuff. Because a lot of over here, it actually made me skip a grade when I came when I came home. I left a sophomore and came out a senior over there. So, so I, I'm not. You're not going to get any you know, uh, disagreement with the UK school, except for your, your, your system of, of metric. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. I, I, my I, butt. Don't, I don't want to move on if someone else has something else to say, yeah. but I am, I'm conscious that we're kind of, we're going back and forth a lot. Yeah. Um, so an, another thing that I want to ask you is because obviously coming from, um, African American descent, as well as, um, Latin, there's a lot of racial tensions, obviously in America at the moment. Um, and a lot of, what um a lot of the time the whole black lives matter movement gets labeled as left and anarchist um and i just want to know what your opinions of yeah. that are because obviously like what are your opinions on first of all black lives matter and do you agree that it's all anarchists um yeah well just institutionalized racism in general like yeah what, what is your take on that because you're actually living in the in the center of it because often in the uk we hear things like it's not as bad as america so we just love to hear your thoughts I'm just walking. So here, here's what I'm going to say. We have to separate the words Black Lives Matter from the actual nonprofit itself, right? Mm -hmm. Black, you're not going to get any argument from, from me on Black Lives Matter or anybody in the United States on the words Black Lives Matter. But what needs to happen is a separation of those three words away from the nonprofit. Because when you go to the website, that is what a lot of us are taking issue with. We have no problem fighting. What if you want to believe that there's institutional racism, systematic racism, and all that? I'm willing to fight with you, right? I'm willing to fight with you on individual cases of it. But what I'm not going to have is calling for the destruction of the nuclear family construct. When we sit here and we say words like that on a website as our mission statement, I am not going to support you because that's actually exactly the opposite of what the black community needs. Over here in Brooklyn. We have 78% single mother households. We need to bring the fathers home. It's the opposite than keeping them out of the home, right? Our systems and our processes, the reason why that I'm huge on attacking Democrats is because they did it to us. Through the introduction of welfare, uh, HUD, SNAP, all that stuff. It was designed to where it said, hey, I will give the mother all this help, but it comes with the stipulation. The father cannot be in the home, right? This leads to a lot of the stuff that we're seeing with violent crime, people, um, depression, um, but you know, you know, trouble, troubling or trouble growing up, you know, like you like always need, always need both. I'm going to be quite honest is that you can't just have the mother for discipline. They need that father aspect. So you see a lot of father issues that lead to that crime, lead to them being in jail leading all of those problems. That, that's what we're trying to fight for in the social justice movement. When Black Lives Matter said that, they turned a lot of us off. We're like, whoa, wait a moment. We are family values. We are all about, you know, we're all about, we're, I'll, I'll just put it this way. I have not met one black person that, or one Latino person that is not family oriented, that cares about yeah. both their mom and dad. I have not, I have not seen, and I was, that's why I was like, holy crap. And then they, they took the fishnet, as I would call it, right? So in the nonprofit realm, you try to focus on maybe two or three different areas. These guys went way out there. They had to put feminism in there. They put LGBTQ things in there. And I'm like, look, if you want to attack racism and all that, you got to hone in on that. If you start adding all those additional things onto it, good luck on getting any of it accomplished here. So 
when we sat there and we're talking about the Justice and Policing Act quite recently, right? Do you know how long that took to get passed? Because you had a DACA win at the Supreme Court and you had an LGBTQ win at the Supreme Court before you had a Justice and Policing win and getting it signed by both the House and the Senate. That's what I was talking about when I was saying, hey, you can't tackle all that stuff and think that you're going to get what you need, right? I don't have a problem with feminism. I don't have a problem with, you know, even the um, the LGBTQ fight. But what I, I can't have is if you're going to tell me that you're fighting racial injustice, you're going to do all this extra stuff. Focus on racial injustice, right? I need you to focus on that. And I... I I, I can't I can't subscribe to them if they don't have any place for the patriarchy or in this in fact bringing the fathers home wanting to deal with the fathers um, and even it, on the Times uh, magazine if you guys ever saw the front cover of the of the Times or is it Rolling Stone Rolling Stones there was a picture of you know the Black Lives Matter and it had the, the black woman and a black kid but the father's not there and it really upset me to where I'm like put the father there next to the mother and have the kid, right? That shows unity in this fight. The other thing that annoys me was when she, when the, one of the leaders said she was a Marxist uh, or trained Marxist. Mm -hmm. Why did you say that? Like now, now like you're going to get attacked. You're going to get yeah. attacked from everybody and their mother. You can't say those words nowadays in America and think that you can't say that because I will tell you, the right is going to hone in on on Marxism, right? I don't like Marxism, nor do I like communism, because I live in a community where the Cuban populace fled um, from uh, Cadet or Castro um, and uh, as Shea, uh, Shea as well, right? So when you're here, people hear the words communism, they hear Marxism, and they get scared, right? Because mm. they're like, oh, my God, we're going to go back in time where, you know, my family fled. That's why you saw Maximo during the, the RNC convention. He spoke out against that. So I'm like, we just need a nonprofit that actually cares to get stuff done if that's what if that's the route we want to go. Or how about we get a congressional members that actually care about um, true um, social justice movement. I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm all for it. I'm all for fixing this. I'm all for fixing police brutality. Um, and I also believe that two things can actually happen at the same time, right? So we can fix police brutality and we can fix inner city violence at the same time. We don't have to have one exist without the other. Both can exist in the same, the same field because we actually have both of them going on. We got issues yeah. with police and we got issues with, um, it's ridiculous this year. I think, I think we're up to like 499. I don't quite know on the exact statistics, but we got a lot of deaths in Chicago and people don't want or they don't want to deal with it. Mm. Um, and that's something within the black community and the, and the you know, that we got to kind of just get over. We have to stop wanting to do the no snitch culture. We want, we got to stop trying to, you know, take these issues and being like, Hey, you know, everybody else, you can't talk about it, but we can talk about it in our community. How about we invite that help in, try to help our youth stop, stop the gang violence, stop the, you know, shooting or over dumb stuff. Stop the stabbing, stop everything else, get it fixed. This is the time. If we're all going to sit here and talk about BLM, this is the time where we tackle all those issues. That's just my thought on it. I, I, I agree. definitely agree. Yeah, no, go on, Samia, because I've seen a lot. <laughs> I was going to say, definitely to tackle uh, police brutality and um, the, the mass shootings within the cities. And I think they yeah. all can be tackled with one thing um, challenging institutional racism. Because like you said, not having a father in the home is all part of, you know, institutional racism. Um, yeah. Not having access to good schools and education, all, you know, a result of institutional racism. And, yeah. and as you said earlier, you don't take a look, when people commit the crime, they don't go back and take a look at what led them to commit that crime. They might have not had food. Someone offered them, you know, a couple of um, dollars to kill someone to feed their family. And we've got to really take a look at why people are doing what they're doing mm -hmm. and really tackle that and I think a lot of it is from you know institutional racism and say with police I, um, in terms of just their training in terms of realizing having a better bridge between the black people and um, the police force um, could actually make um, police brutality a thing of the past and I hope 
in the near future that will happen for America. Yeah. But can I ask you a question? Um, have you witnessed institutional racism? Um, do you think it exists in America? Um, yeah, and have you experienced a personal uh, case of racism ever? Well, it's it's kind of hard to say whether you could see an instance or, I mean, be recipient of an instance of institutional racism, because that, that debate still continues to come on, whether, whether um, but yes, I've dealt with racism, um, being one of the only black kids in the schools in Orange County that I went to, um, or minority. So uh, majority of the schools in my area were uh, rich, um, upper class, white kids. And I just so happened to be lucky enough to get to go to the school. Um, but the way that they looked at me was was kind of interesting. Uh, the way they treated me was kind of interesting. Um, and, you know, I even saw it somewhat sometimes in the Marines, um, you know, with some some people that are not used to seeing minorities because they grew up in, you know, the middle of nowhere, Texas. Um, so things like that. So, yes, I've, I've dealt with instances of racism. But here's here's where I've been conditioned to look at this stuff a little bit different. Right. I, I tend to. I tend to sit here and I dissect what it would what, what it means to mean institutional racism, right? You guys remember the the um, 1964 um, introduction of EEOC guidelines, right? Or have ever ever heard of those? Um, so it is the it's the principles that are that you cannot discriminate in any workplace based upon um, race, nationality, creed, uh, gender, and sexual orientation. Actually, they just once again uh, ruled that LGBTQ was a part of that the equal opportunity, right? which we all knew this anyway, but I guess they had to re go back to court to re you know, uh, re-decide this. But um, so those are actually at an institutional level. A lot of people don't know this. this is actually, they have to be implemented at institutional level. What's actually happening in a lot of corporate and even military police and all that stuff is they're not holding people accountable to those EEOC guidelines. Because I will say in the military, as a military or former military leader, if I had anybody who violated those those guidelines, they're getting punished. They go through an investigation, and sometimes they even get kicked out of the military, depending on the, the severity of it. And that comes down to the individual leaders like me saying, hey, I will hold that program. I will hold it. I will hold people accountable. Mm -hmm. What needs to happen in the police is this. If they're not wanting to hold those the people accountable at the lieutenant level, the captain level, and all that, they need to be fired. They need to be out of there. And I'm I'm totally with you guys on that, right? Because at an institutional level, you do have those value system there in place that that EEOC guidelines. So it's actually up to um, those individual institutions to start kicking people out that are not going to abide by it and enforce those rules. Um, now, when it comes to systematic and all that stuff, I understand what you guys are talking about. But I actually look at it different. I look at it as anything that is big government assistance style programs is where the racism comes in because it creates the dependency, right? I, you know, have you guys are you guys heard the fable of um, the whole fish, right? Where like, hey, I can teach you um, yeah. how to fish. Yeah, all that. Okay, so that's saying, right? That is actually what the Republicans stand for, and that's why I'm like, okay, I kind of find it hard to believe when it comes to them being systematically racist because what they're what they do in all their programs is hey here's this tool all right now because now you can go out there and become financially independent you don't need us there's limited government the opposite is happening right now in a lot of democrat cities or ran cities it's a dependency you need me you need me for welfare you need me for section eight you need me for a methadone clinic you need me for this and that, right? I don't want them, right? I, nobody wants these people because guess what? Is They hold it over your head every two, four, six years for elections. And that is the only time you see them is when they come down and be like, guess what? I gave you welfare. I gave you this. How about you give me a job, right? How about you give me the things that I need to get away from you and become financially independent, right? That's where I see the, the racism coming in. Right. I even see it in, the, in, you know, I do agree somewhat with you guys when it comes to or, you know, with the left 
uh, when it deals with, um, you know, gender inequality and wage gaps within, you know, the workforce. I see that a lot too. Um, because um, JP Morgan Chase down in Brooklyn, I caught an instance of that happening um, where they had two people, same, um, you know, same qualifications. It just happened to be one was a black woman and she got paid less. And I was like, wait a moment. So beforehand, I never thought that, you know, that wage gap kind of thing was kind of real, but I do, and I do agree with you guys. And I'm one, probably one of the only Republicans where I'm like, hey, this needs to stop. So there is a system like that happening. And you got two people with the same yeah. qualifications and somebody's getting paid less, of course, I'm gonna be mad. Um, and I hope that kind of answers your questions right now, but I will say that I don't, when it comes to personal racism and all that stuff, I've, I've gotten called all sorts of names. In fact, I continue to get called all sorts of names because I'm a minority Republican and it usually comes from white liberals. Mm. They will call me anything and everything and it's socially acceptable for them to do so. Um, from, you know, actually I'm not gonna say any of that stuff on, on LinkedIn or not LinkedIn, but uh, on here, cause I don't think it's appropriate. Um, but yes, the racism does exist now towards the minority Republican. And it's quite interesting on how we're treated just because what we essentially are, are thinking for ourselves. It's not, we don't want to be told how to think, what to think, um, and how to feel on any situation from a Democrat or a, because we left them on purpose. Like you, they had their chance. They, they don't want to earn our boom. They don't want to take care of us. Right. I've been a Democrat for many, many years beforehand, but I saw how they just used our people. And then they only they come with a handout for fundraising when they're trying to get elected. So I mean, it's it's go ahead. I just wanted to clarify. Um, so, oh, sorry. I just want to really qu quickly clarify. So you said when it comes to institutionalized or systemic racism, um, dem Democrats are mainly the cause of that. So you don't think Republicans have any sort of um, influence, or they're not like? No, I'm not. I'm not going to say they did, but you got to look at historical context of how this came to be. Why, why are we seeing what we're seeing today, right? That actually goes back to LBJ and back in the 60s underneath the great societal programs that created the, the demand, right? When they started doing the welfare aspect, then we go a little bit forward and then you can go into redlining where the black community wasn't allowed to get certain things from banks, right? Certain loans, certain uh, mm -hmm. stuff that would have helped them out. And that's both a Republican and a Democrat issue, yeah, right? Yeah. Then you got the opioid crisis and all that stuff. Yeah. But what they don't tell you from the Democrat side, because they want to make it look like it's all Republicans, is that it was our own community poisoning ours, right? You guys ever heard the story of Frank Lucas, the American gangster, ever paid yeah. by Denzel Washington, right? You ever watch um, The Godfather of Harlem, um, which is, is Bumpy Jones? When you look at that, they were pumping, they were pumping millions upon millions of pounds of heroin um opioids into our own communities our own people were doing that alongside you know the mobs and other stuff like that so yes we have to kind of somewhat take responsibility for what we did opioid wise all right and then you can keep going forward you know you have i don't know if you guys know this but the child support the family courts they all profit from our separations there's so much that goes into it at a government level to where i'm like it's kind of hard for me to sit here and pick this and say, hey, it's a Republican issue, it's a Democrat issue. But I would say historically it started to me from a Democrat. When you look back and you look at who implemented these, these big, huge, sweeping government policies, right? So I can actually label it and say, hey, LBJ started this, right? So- Can I ask you, if you're such a free thinker and you acknowledge that both the Republicans and Democrats have issues, why associate with either of them? Because Why here, put here in America, you've got a two-party system. They try to make it look like it's a, like the third party can win, right? Uh, When's the last time you seen, when are you seeing an independent win anything? Never. All right, the only time you're seeing that is Bernie Sanders, who's actually an independent, independent but that guy is so far off the, the scale, I don't even think he's even inside the left or right ladder or inside <laughs> the limits. That guy is like all the way out there. Um, and it is the independents really don't stand a shot because when it comes to campaigning, those Democrats and Republicans have so much money that they can drown you out real quick if you're running as an independent and you, you really mm -hmm. don't stand a chance. 
So the only reason why I'm more towards the right than I am the left is because the right has more of a family oh. values concept, more believing in small business, right? Um, they're naturally more religious in their in their beliefs on the on the right because uh, I tend to be I'm Catholic. Um, the the more stances and I and I know you guys are gonna nail me over the head for this, um, but more of a pro life stance than pro choice, right? Um, and as I said, I believe in financial what? independence, what? <laughs> limited government. Go ahead. I know, I know, I already know you guys want to nail me all that. I said, I said the magic words of, of, of pro-life. Go ahead. Um, I have a quick question before we dive into what you've said. Yeah. I think whatever you've said has been quite reasonable and, you know, I've learned a lot. And I think, um, I, I get you, I get what you're saying about you support the policy and you've been looking at Trump's policies as opposed to his words and his history. But the, the bigger issue is, obviously you've taken the time to educate yourself, but the wider people, who, the wider general, like, you know, general okay. population yeah. who support Trump, they wouldn't do what you've taken the time to do. So when Trump is openly saying, grab them by the whatever, when he spoke about, you know, women, when he's saying, if Ivanka wasn't my daughter, I would date her, when he's when he actually had a federal case when he won the president when he, when he won the, when he was the um, nominee he had a federal case of you know child abuse kind of like pending when things like this when you support somebody like that even though you're supporting the policy to the wider population it looks like you're supporting everything he stands for it's really difficult to separate a policy from the president because when you're saying Yes, I support his, you know, he's done all of this. Like, I, mean, I didn't even realize that he'd done all that amazing stuff. But that's great if, you know, it does have the intended um, result. Impact, yeah. yeah, but what you're supporting is a bigot who is racist and sexist in what he's saying. And he's supporting... And you also know, encouraging... Encouraging other, others, yeah. Other people to be that And way. when he said, when he talked about, um, you know, they'll get what they... I, I'm quoting it wrong, but some the gist was, you know, if they don't stop writing, they'll get what they want. He was basically threatening... His own, you know, who's his supposed population. to, yeah, his population, yeah. who's supposed to be leading. And when you support policies, when, when the leaders like that, you're inherently supporting the leader. And even though, you know, I get what you're saying, but I, I, I would like to ask, and maybe this is quite a difficult question, but I'd like to ask, if you were, you know, Tamir Rice's parents, if you were, you know, just... Like, if you Jacob were Blake, Jacob Blake's family, parents, family George members, family. exactly, or, you know, Brianna Taylor, if you were her fiancé, when he did assert his Second Amendment right when the police barged in, and then she got was, arrested. then got arrested, and she was shot eight times, would you still be saying the exact same it's, thing? It's, would you still be saying... See, this is the problem. This is the problem. You just use... You, just, you guys just use a lot of different cases where we got to... We got to be careful. Right on M from Kyle Rittenhouse to James Blake, uh, definitely Breonna Taylor, um, and all these other cases, you have to be very careful because here in the United States, we believe in the constitutional rights of due process, right? And the rule of law. I'm one of those, I'm one of those uh, Republicans that will sit there and say, hey, media stay out of this, uh, politics stay out of this, let the investigate let the investigation take place. If there's an indictment to come, obviously let the indictment come. But everybody has the presumption of innocence until proven guilty. Whether we like that cop or not, whether we like the other side or not, right? Does it happen? I already know you're probably going to go, with, does it happen? No, it doesn't happen quite a lot, right, with the presumption of innocence. But we have to because here's the problem. With a lot of these cases, it's, you know, it starts to slowly leak. It starts to slowly come forward. And then we find out the cop wasn't wrong. If you actually look back into Breonna Taylor, I will tell you that whole narrative that media put out is absolutely wrong. I have the warrants, right? I have the ability to research the warrants. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Why is he suing the police then? Because there's evidence to prove- Oh, you can sue the police. Oh, you can sit there and sue it, but this guy is probably gonna end up in jail, right? The story switch, because here's the deal. On the warrant, her address is actually on there. Her name is on there. Remember the whole media thing where, oh, they got the wrong house, they got whatever? No, it's on the warrant. Not only that, but surveillance came out beforehand, watching him and her come out of a trap house with drugs back and forth. Oh, this is what I said, okay. is you have to wait for the whole investigation to be complete because we may unintentionally 
cry an officer. You will never ever get to be able to get a job again after the fact. And when we sit there and do that, remember Sandman? Remember Sandman? David, sorry, I, I, you, you seem very enthusiastic in following the laws and the right procedures, yes. especially in terms of being innocent to proven guilty. And absolutely, we're, we're absolutely behind that. And um, you have to be, you assume their innocence before proven guilty, yes. both here in the UK and in the US. And also, I don't know um, too much about US politics, but the police are not the jury and the executor either. So what the, the examples that you, we've just discussed is, first of all, um, the innocence and proven guilty was not applied to her. She didn't go through the proper court system. She didn't get to um, explain her side. She didn't get her rights that she should have got. He did instead the police. He did. Um, Here, here's the problem. Party. Here's here's the problem. She did, because here's the deal. They were they were serving out a no knock warrant, right? And they, there was a reason why with drugs they tend to go with no knock warrants for these. She yeah. would. The right. judge would not have signed off on it if they did not have the evidence. And I read the I read the the warrants. Now it's not her fault that her boyfriend decided to shoot. That's the guy I take issue with because the whole thing where he's like, oh, no, they didn't announce themselves. It comes out where he changed his story. He recanted and said they did announce themselves. It even came out that the cops did on their side as well in the investigation. There's so much wrong with the story to where now the media made it look like this cop or these cops are, were completely wrong. Now these cops are being found out that they're completely correct. What, yeah, what do you do now in that justification? Did. When you fry a my, my cop for, for no reason, what do you do in that justification? What do you do for them? My, my point was um, that the police officer um, was not there to um, shoot her or kill her, but was there to arrest her so she can go through the proper process. And exactly, you but what do you do if you shoot at a cop? Here's my problem. If I shoot at a cop, do, am I expected that the cop does not shoot back? Well, surely. Yeah, right. Right. Can I that's what happened in that case. That's what happened. The boyfriend shot on behalf of that girl. He shot, and he shot multiple times. They could not see exactly where those shots came from. They had to fire back into the house, serving a warrant, which is justified. And what, David, I don't know what to tell one, you off of that. It's not racism. That is just bad behavior. I can't, I can't justify bad behavior. It's in Ray Sharp Brooks. Why are there so many cases? Why are there so many cases where where people are being unjustly killed. You can't yeah. really ignore Here's that. what I say. A lot of times they take these hand-picked ones because I, I can sit here and do the same thing. I can sit here and show you where white or white individuals are being killed at the same rate, right? I can show but you where white unarmed people but even, but even so, are being killed at the same. Because we're in a day and age of social media. We got these, oops, and now you see it, right? We got phones. Yeah. What I could do real quickly is I could take hand cases and I could put them in front of people and I can make an argument. The problem is, is they're not being intellectually honest. Because when you look at the statistics, actually more white unarmed people are killed by police than black. But that's the issue. Police brutality is still an issue. Un it un is. I'm not saying that it's not. If there are unjust cases, they need to be handled on both sides. Yeah. Right? Whether it be white, black, in between, yeah. it needs to be handled. But I'm not going to play race. I'm not going to say you're play race on it because here's the problem. I don't think it's race. What I think it is, is, and you guys remember the Stanford experiment, right? Yes, yes. Right? When you hand somebody power, you're they use yeah. it. And I think it's a power, not a race. Because you have black cops killing black people. Is that now becoming a race issue? Because a black cop doesn't like another black person? I highly doubt that. So, so what what you're saying, I agree with. Um, have you also seen the doll experiment? The what? The doll experiment. No, go ahead and explain it. It looks at so it looks at basically it's done with children and it looks at um, they're given a white doll and a black doll and the children. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Okay, yes. Yeah, I, I didn't know you said doll. Oh, okay, sorry, my <laughs> accent. <laughs> um, yeah, so with um, obviously you said black black cops are also um, you know. They hate black. They, yeah, there's black cops that can also be brutal towards yeah. black people as well. There's also that issue of um, stereotypes and internalized racism that America perpetuates. That black people are criminals. Black people, um, all the negative, a terrible yeah, a terrible all, fathers, all of that negative stuff. So naturally, first of all, human beings are given authority that goes to their head. Second of all, they're given stereotypes 
uh, they've got subconscious bias about a race that is so negative that they then act on that. So that's, that's also an issue. So you're, it's all, there's so many things that add up to it. So you're saying black cops can also be brutal, but I, I in itself, like um, Samia says, it all comes down to institutionalized racism mm -hmm. because it's internalized racism. Once again, I mean, technically we, we do it all the time, right? When it comes to stereotypes, what were the races of the cops in, in George Floyd? There was um, white and an Asian guy, yeah. What were the races of the cops? And you, you got to look at this because what's quite interesting is if they have light pigmentation, what does the media and the left like to call them? Call them white. Are they white? No, they're not. I'm, I am dating a, a African woman who's white pigmentation, but she's African, right? And here in America, guess what we label her? Caucasian. We call her white, even though she's from Africa. Right? She is more African American than whatever. This is the problem is that we sit and we put these labels, right? It, it gives into the stereotyping. One of the biggest things that I can't stand is the words white privilege. Because guess what you just did? You it's just played the same game. You just played the same game from the opposite side, right? The words, I understand the concept of white privilege, but saying that in itself is division. It is divisive, right? And, you're lit, and when you're in a population where majority are white, and you're going to be like, oh, hey, you know what? You got white privilege, right? That, that is like, whoa, you were purposely, it's like you're purposely putting on gloves and you want to get in a fight with somebody. No, right? but I have a question, though. I, I generally do have a question. Just, just from your, and you could, you could come with your smart rebuttals, but say you have a person walking down, walking down an alley, right? Different alleys. One is white, one is black. Who do you think, and they're both doing the exact same, same, you know, attributes, and maybe they might be acting whatever you call suspicious, right? So say they are cop presence in both, both the neighborhoods. Who do you think cops are more likely to stop? Just and, statistically and, more likely. And be and scared of. Be scared of. And think that they're doing something yeah. wrong. Just statistically. I'm going to be quite honest. You have to do a little bit more into that. Because it depends on where you're at. Because I actually, as I said, I work with law enforcement and it depends on where you're at. Because what, they, what unfortunately the citizens don't understand is how policing is really done. Policing isn't, if, if I'm in an area and I got a high crime rate of a certain demographic, of course, you're gonna be a little bit more suspicious of that certain demographic. If I'm in the middle of nowhere, let's use Arkansas, where there's majority white people there, of course, the white person is going to be the one you stop in the alley. If you're in the middle of, let's say, um, Detroit or, you know, certain parts of Chicago, of course, the black person is the one you're going to stop, right? It, this stereotyping happens on both sides. We're just not being intellectually honest. It happens in our community. When I'm in Brooklyn, guess what? The West Indians don't like Africans. The Africans don't like Dominicans. All this stuff, this happens throughout all of our people, but we're not being intellectually honest. There are places where I've seen people be um, stereotyped against the Indian community, right? And I don't like that either over here, right? I've seen it all over the place. I know Canada's got a huge yeah. problem with stereotyping against, against the um, Indian community. The power. But there's a difference between prejudice and not liking another community um, from a minority perspective and then having the power to actually perpetuate that hatred you, and then affect someone's life. Yeah. That's the difference. It's the, it's the, it's the it's power. It's the power dynamic. Yeah, it's the different. power dynamic. So you're telling me that minorities are not sitting in, in positions of power to be able to... Not over them. white people. Not in an over yeah, they do. I president think. Obama, you don't think he had the ability to do what he needed to do? He was a president. He could have definitely, if he wanted to, he could have definitely done something. That was a position of power. If a mayor, you think a mayor can't? You think that a police chief can't? You think that any, if you're a minority and you're sitting in those seats, you could definitely... I have do those a kind of things. For President Obama, I have a quick question for you. If President Obama tweeted everything Trump tweeted, but about white people, so if he said, you know, white people are racist, or like he, he was saying certain, the same tweets, just reverse the race and reverse the president, do you think President Obama would have gotten away with it with as much same. as Trump has? I'm, I'm going to be honest on Obama's eight years. The media definitely did do a whole lot of coddling on there. There was only one that did it, and it was Fox News. We all know Fox News doesn't like anything that, that comes from the left, right? Um, and I will tell you that Fox News is biased. Um, but yes, there was a whole lot of coddling that went on from the media during his time frame. Shoot, 
they didn't like they almost gave him like a royal send off, and they ended this eight years with you know with the the concerts, the all that. Did they have Jay Z and Beyonce up in the White House and all that stuff? He was a celebrity. I'm not gonna lie, Obama was a celebrity to everybody over here from the left, and you had some light Republicans, as I would call them. They liked him too. But I'm gonna tell you, he was coddled. So anything that would have dealt with Obama, I'm gonna be quite honest. Would it would it have translated this way? I don't think so. I think so. I think it would have been worse. Yeah. No, if he had said, I don't if he, think so. If, if if Trump if Obama had said if Sasha wasn't my daughter, I would be dating her. You think that would have gotten away with it? Because look at what's happening right now with the pedophilia stuff. <laughs> look how many leftist people are getting away with it. I don't Trump know if you know this, but Epstein was not a Republican. Not Obama. Epstein was a left. You had Weinstein, or uh, what is his name, Harvey Weinstein? Yeah. Harvey Weinstein was a, a staunch Democrat, and he got, like, he was one day in court, and then one day gone, and there was not enough scrutiny on that guy. A lot of the left get away with that kind of behavior, and there's not a lot of scrutiny that goes towards it. You see a lot of this happening. Like, I think it's people yeah. in power. Harvey, yeah. Harvey's in politics, so I, that, that, yeah. that doesn't compare, because... He may be a Democrat, but he's an individual person, so he doesn't represent the whole Oh, you, you got to understand how politics works. Where do you think they get their money from? Where do you think these donors, or the, the, who these donors are? Who, where do you think they get all this money? You don't randomly get $300 million to Biden. You don't randomly get $300 million for, uh, what is it, uh, AOC or any of these other things. People donate, and these are the types of people that are in the background doing so. I understand the money in politics, but what I'm saying is when you're a figurehead, you actually have a responsibility to act a certain way because you're looked at and you're seen as a, in, um, in high regard. Pre Trump is the president. There's certain things that you just cannot say as the president and you okay. should not say. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, explain, you, explain um, it. Because um, as I said, a lot of these times it comes back to the way that it's reported. Right, the Charlottesville is one of the biggest the lies ever. Charlottesville is one of the biggest lies ever. David, he no, I listened to the recording. I listened with my own ears. There was no uh, bias of the media. We all know the media's bias. He said, grab them by the pussy. Okay, that <laughs> is a 2016 thing. And yes, everybody <laughs> does not like that. <laughs> right? Everybody <laughs> said something against that. <laughs> but is that going to disqualify the candidate? Because if we're going to go by that standard, Biden should be disqualified for saying you ain't black to the black community or the 1.6 million black Americans that voted for Trump. Right? If we're going to sit here and talk about one-for-one -one exchanges of what people can say and can't say, we can sit here and play this game all day. Right? Both need to be held accountable. But is that going to disqualify the candidate? Um, I think it now. should do. I think, I think no, you know, because of due process. Wants... You told me you believed in due process. Do yeah. we stop yeah, at I a do. complaint or do we stop at, or do we say, hey, when you're convicted, conviction is different than a complaint. Well, Somebody can make an allegation and complain all day. It doesn't make it true. Conviction. When it's a racist system, how do you convict when judge, jury, and executioner, they're all subscribing to the same belief system? How do you convict how, them? how can we sit here and say that the judges, all, every single judge here is going to sit there and say that? Or how can I say, I can't say and, and attack the whole judicial system as being, being that way. Okay. Dude, you would have never even got, you would have never yeah. gotten, like, I don't know if you know the Ninth Circuit. Or, or the Court of Appeals over there, but that tends yeah. to be liberal yeah. judges. You have a lot of liberal judges. You have a lot of Republican judges over here. I'm not going to sit here and, and attack the character of the individual judge or whether they're going to say, hey, I'm going to do the right thing or I'm going to do the wrong thing. But they voted the right way on DACA. They voted the right way on LGBTQ. So, yeah, yeah. you got to have somewhat of faith in these judges. You can't ignore the bias, though, because there's the statistics show, even in things like cases like death row, for example, there's an overwhelming presence of the black community um, on death row. For the same crime. For the same I don't, look at, I don't look at race when it comes to crime because I look at the crime itself that was committed by the individual. And so if there's in somebody on death row that doesn't deserve to be there, yes, I believe in the appeals process and I believe in the ability of using somebody like Innocence Project to go ahead up and get them out of it. But what I'm not going to sit here and say is, because of your race, you're, you're misrepresented or there's overrepresentation. No, there was crimes committed. No, there's crimes committed, but what is Sorry, Samantha. Ryan Row and Trump together, there was a notorious case um, from, 
the now they see us the where the the boys in Brooklyn um was You're talking about Central Park Five. Yes, they were. And and Donald Trump took out a page in the newspaper to, to to tell everyone why they should be on death row, why they should have the death penalty. And they didn't commit the crime. And I think this is why there's this over representation of black people on these things. Is that there are I don't think that has anything to do with race. I'm gonna be quite honest. And because hey, I'm over here in this area and what people actually mm -hmm. took offense to was the crime itself. A lot of people were upset. Remember Kavanaugh? Do you think Kavanaugh was based upon race? No, it's based upon a sexual or an allegation of a sexual crime, right? He still got elected. That's the yeah, problem, yeah. David. He still got elected. Hold on. You're, you're, let, me, let me make my point. Let me make my point. It was based upon a heinous sexual allegation, right? A possible rape. The Central Park Five, that's what that allegation was, was a rape of the lady in a park, yeah. right? No, and no, an no. assault. It has nothing to do with the race of why people were upset. A lot of New Yorkers are upset in here in New York over the Central Park Five. They're both black and white and in between because no, the reason, they still believe the that these people I are guilty. And I'm no, like, hey, look, and guess what? who actually errs on the side of innocence? If somebody I, is acquitted, we must treat them as if they are acquitted. And we need to stop trying to, and I attack Trump on this. If you were acquitted, you must be treated as such. Because here's the deal. If I'm going to go ahead and use Central Park Five as an argument, oh. Guess what you can't do as an argument? Use impeachment as a freaking argument, right? Because Trump was acquitted mm -hmm. by the Senate, which means if you believe in actual due process and rule law and somebody's acquitted, you must treat everybody the same. I have a question for you, uh, just just off the side. Do you think Kavanaugh was guilty? Do you think he should have he should have been signed? You know, he was sworn in as judge. Do you? I just want to understand. What do you think? Do you think I can't say whether he's he was innocent or guilty. What I know of is that the FBI investigated him multiple different That's times in the nomination I process. I can't say whether he's innocent or guilty because it's not me. Who decides that? Once again, mm -hmm. we keep going back to the rule of law and we keep going back to due process. We got to let the court systems do what they do. If he was <laughs> guilty of it, he should be brought or not guilty. But if he's the accusation, I did believe, hey, look, the FBI the FBI looked at him like, I think it was like, they said almost like 17 different times. They brought that, they brought him through the ringer and asked questions and they did all that stuff. I, if they couldn't indict, then I can't say that the guy's guilty of anything. I okay. leave it up to that. I can't, I can't sit here and argue on your, on your side. Cause yeah, do I like sexual assaults and crime? Hell no. Mm -hmm. I'd love to see those people in jail all day. But if I can't see an indictment towards it, then I can't sit here and condemn a person. Because what that's going to do is character assassination. And what that does is slander. Unless somebody is actually proven guilty, I don't like to slander the individual. Okay. Right? And it's the same thing with the Central Park Five. I don't like people slandering them because they were found innocent. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So just to clarify then, David, um, just on this point in terms of like the judicial system, you don't think there's any racial bias within the judicial system and how uh, the justice system overall, you don't think there's any racial bias going on in America? I think there's actually system problems. And there's something that you, you guys aren't probably being told is there's not enough latitude by the, or not enough, I say latitude, there's not a lot of autonomy or the judges cannot make certain decisions that they should be able to make. Minimum sentencing. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. Yeah. But yeah. judges didn't have a choice. If it was a certain if it was a certain crime, they had to go with a certain time, right? Mm. They they need to be able to have the autonomy to say, hey, if somebody comes in with a marijuana charge, and we all understand the 1994 crime bill, we all understand the whole mass incarceration aspect. Yeah, those judges should have been able to say, you know what, it's, it's a stupid charge. Let me go ahead and help you rehabilitate, and let me let's not use the judicial process for this. And because I don't, why stack these jails that way? And I'll tell you why, because those are privatized industries that are profiting <laughs> from those jails. Yeah. Of course, that makes sense to stick yeah. more people in there, right? And I, we, 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 I think that's something both the left and right can understand together is attacking those, those private jails and attacking that kind of behavior from our judicial system. No, we need a more fair process. Now, I'm going to say, is it racial? No, I just think it's a power move once again. When you're sitting behind a chair and you can say, hey, you're five years, you get 10 years, I think that's what it is. 
So what, but who do you think has the power in it? Um, like I know you have black, white, Mexican, and yeah. all sorts of different types of drugs. Mm -hmm. So I, am I going to sit here and say that they have racial intent? No, I, I believe when, when you have individual cases of racial bias, yes, I will stand with you and fight with you all day and every day. But what I'm not going to sit here and do is judge the general masses as being racist or being sexist or being whatever, because that's just not right to do. If you can bring individual cases to me and say, hey, this is what's going on, I will fight with you to the end. Right, but I'm not going to sit here and judge the the child yeah. This is not me. Okay, okay. Serena, well, what we personal um, life, like I don't know who your associates are, but do you ever get backlash for your views, like from the black community, from the Latino community, like people you know, your family? Do they do they like agree with you? Do you ever get called a coon? I've just been listening like to everything, and I just want to get more understanding into like how your life is. Yeah. So yeah, I get, I get backlash from I get backlash from all sorts of communities, the white community, the black community, and in between. But the, the cool part is is it's it's almost similar um, to what we're having here. It's it's usually a good dialogue, right? Where I'm open to all sorts of opinions and and, and I respect all everybody's outlook, right? Because sometimes, hey, you may have a good outlook and guess what? I'm going to go ahead and be like, hey, you know what? I'm going to go back to the drawing board and I'm going to look at it. And if you guys are correct and all that, I will change my opinion to meeting what meets the people. Mm -hmm. Right. Because I don't actually put party before the people. I actually care about the people first. Right. And if something, if, if I'm wrong here, then I, I will change my, my opinion of things. Right. But the problem is, is um, there's a lot of people. It's almost like sports teams here in America. Right. You either got, you know, the New England Patriots or you got like Falcons or whatever it is. Right. And one side being the Democrat, one side being the Republican. If you say something against my team, guess what? You know, I, I gotta, I gotta defend it, right? That's how we treat like Republicans and Democrats here. And it's like, see, people are so dug in in their ways that it takes people to have to sit objectively in the middle. Whether mm -hmm. like people like me that are like, hey, let's go ahead and have a civil dialogue, civil uh, discourse here, and let's really think about it. And a lot of times, I've turned Democrats to Republicans. And I've had some people that are like, you know what, no, um, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna continue my way. But it's been usually respectful. Now there's been some times where it's 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 crazy, and those are tend to be my my far left individuals that are that are that come at me a certain way. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's the, like the moderate Democrats are are good to deal with. The far left is is they don't like they don't like Republicans. They don't even like moderate Democrats. <laughs> like I don't know what they like. It's, it's kind of hard to find something that they do. And yeah. it's, their style of debate has been what I've been taking, you know, I have an issue with because they just come off like, hey, you're racist, you're, you're all sorts of phobics, uh, whatever <laughs> flavor phobic they come up with that day, uh, all sorts of stuff. Um, so, yeah, I mean, other than that, I mean, I'm, I'm being a prior Marine and being a soldier, words don't really bother me much because um, I'm going to continue to do what I need to do to, you know, say, hey, America, Let's really look at these hard issues and let's let's solve it as we're Democrats and Republicans together, bipartisanly, right? Yeah. And independents. We'll add the independents in there as well and add that third that sit in the middle and they, they got no home. So we'll add them to our, our discussion, right? I, I think this conversation is a perfect example of this. Um, you know, we are, if we were in America, I'm sure we would be the Democrats um, and uh, you're Republicans. And I, I think it's so important to have these conversations um, in a very respectful and inter um, intellectual way. Uh, there are many points that we agreed on. There's been points that we disagreed on, but as long as we keep on having conversations, I think uh, this is the way forward. And just as a, as, as people of color on this, um, on, on this, podcast i think one thing we can all include um think is important that we should all get involved and whether it is republican or democrats whether it's conservatives or uh, yeah. labor we should all be involved in politics we should all have our voices heard and i think uh i think this is i think you guys should join a turning point uk <laughs> <laughs> no no blexit uk or no no <laughs> thank you very much for coming on david this has been no problem we would love maybe in the future, you know, once the election results come out, maybe we should do a party. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, don't don't be calling me if it's Biden though, because we, we ain't playing that game. We ain't playing that game where you rub it in. I'm just joking. You guys can call me if it's Biden. <laughs> we will. <laughs> <laughs>
one last thing, David, before we go. What are your personal political plans moving forward? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so next year I'm up for uh, New Jersey State Senate. Ooh. Um, so um, I'll be running on the on the Republican line or the Republican ticket. Um, once again, as I said, I'm not your typical uh, your typical Republican. I actually believe in bipartisan. Um, I believe in actually. I can't, I need to stop saying bipartisan because I I'm I'm leaving out the middle man, right? So yes, or even our independents just sit there in the middle. I'll listen to them as well. But yeah, so I start off with state state senate next year, uh, trying to take back Trenton, uh, New Jersey from from the Democrats, right? But um, if that you know, so that's where I want to start off. But then I'll eventually work my way up to uh, Congress, maybe Senate, and all that stuff. And I'll stop there because I, I never want to be a president because we all see how this ends up. Where yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll be discussing you. In a few yeah, you know what I'm saying? This guy is <laughs> this guy is racist and you know, yeah. sexist and I'm like, geez, I, I'm not even gonna go on Twitter. I'm not the president. I'm gonna go ahead and keep that phone. I think away. that's a safe bet. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. So, but I appreciate you guys and I do miss the UK. You guys are awesome over there. I had a great, you know, I'm few back. years living there. <laughs> yeah, so it's nice having this conversation, David. Thank you so much. Hey, all right, Thank take you. care guys. Hey, Kat. Hey, Kat. Thanks for listening, guys. This was Untold, and we'll be with you again next week. Bye. Bye.